What's going on, everybody? Super excited to bring you this conversation of why quantum matters to the Navy and the Marine Corps. Today, I have some awesome guests. Myself, I am Mohawk Matt, mostly just here for the hair. You know, somebody's got to keep it real. And But super excited. I'm going to start out introducing Dr. Tommy Willis, who is the Navigation Timing and Quantum um, Program Officer for Office of Naval Research for the Department of the Navy. Tommy, how's it going? Good. Uh, good morning, Matt. Thanks a lot for having me on. Appreciate it. Good morning. Super excited. I think with my mohawk and your mustache, we've got the perfect duo happening right here. Agree. Agree. So I, I think anyone watching this, it's a great ha hairstyle to emulate for future, <laughs> for sure. And then also with us, we've got the one and only, the acquisition chief for the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, I call him Hondo, but you could you know him as Secretary Jim Hondo Gertz. Secretary Gertz, how's it going? Uh, good to see you, Mohawk. You're displaying the quantum there. You either have hair or no hair. You're a one or a zero, so that's awesome. Way to go. Way to way to way to represent. Yeah, I just I I shaved it just last night, just for yeah, this. There you go. Just for this. So, gentlemen, today we're going to talk about kind of what quantum is and why it really matters to us in the Navy and Marine Corps. So I'm gonna start out with Tommy, Dr. Willis. Kind of help us understand, when I think of quantum, my brain goes to Avengers or Ant-Man or the quantum realm or the old show in the 90s, Quantum Leap. Is that is that quantum or help us understand what quantum really is? So uh, I think all those would qualify, but um, okay. maybe a slightly more technical definition uh, is that quantum, systems are ones that, and it's a little circular, but it's, bear with me, are ones that require quantum mechanics to understand their behavior and their characteristics. Okay. So the simplest, ex you know, uh, by analogy, a pendulum clock just ticks back and forth. You just need basic, you know, high school physics to understand that thing. It just, Newton's laws, right, ticks back and forth. But uh, a, an atomic clock is based, let's say, on the energy level structure of an atom. And to understand all those quantized energy levels in an atom, you have to use Schrodinger's equation, which is the you know basis of quantum mechanics. Obviously. So that's the, you know, that that's one way to to understand the system. If you got to use quantum mechanics, I call it quantum. So okay. Well, yep. I'm, I'm glad you're here because when you say like you need a basic level of high school physics, I just, I'm going to leave the room. <laughs> I, I, I barely have a, a basic understanding of high school lunch. Like, so that, that's why you're here for sure. I miss high school lunch. Actually. <laughs> it's, it's a lot like the military. It's, it's not that great. Mm -hmm. So, um, Secretary Gertz, why is quantum important to the Navy and Marine Corps? Yeah, so two two things. Uh, one, I'm, unlike Dr. Willis here, uh, again, I'm not not a super genius. I got a big neck. I think two things are are uh, really interesting here. Uh, over 300 years ago, the actual Royal Navy had a challenge, just like we're doing here with our Air Force teammates, to go figure out how to get accurate time because of a actually a pretty bad collision in I think it was 1607, if I remember right, uh, and so. Uh, time has been important to the Navy long before we had a U.S. Navy uh, because it helps you navigate, uh, whether you're in the air or on the water or under the water or in space, yes. quite frankly. And so uh, so time's always been important. Uh, teaming with uh, creative, uh, uh, innovative folks uh, has always been important. Working uh, across the joint uh, world has been important. And then finding the best out there in the world to help us solve problems are important. Uh, so that's why both quantum and uh, and this event, I think, are key for all of us here. Trying to find great new ideas, uh, apply them to an age-old problem uh, to give us an advantage uh, going forward. Okay. And tell me, what, what are, are you doing any research in quantum right now? Yeah, so I think to follow on to what I was saying before, uh, the... The, you know, these quantum characteristics give rise to better performance. If you look at an atomic clock versus a, a pendulum clock or the Harrison chronometer, which came out of that challenge you just spoke about, Secretary, uh, the, the atomic clocks blow them out of the water. And so the 
this precision and accuracy that's afforded by quantum clocks, quantum sensors, one day quantum inertial sensors, once we get them there and get them fielded. Um, and then the power in quantum computing, uh, that the, the promise of quantum computing down the road all has uh, a lot of potential applications to the Navy, of course. Um, and so ONR invests uh, heavily in a number of different technologies, clocks, inertial, sensors, communications, and computing. And so across the Navy, we have investment uh, at the warfare centers. We have investment at NRL, which is our working capital lab. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we continue to try to push the technologies into the field uh, as, as, you know, as quickly as we can. So that, that's fantastic. And, and what I love to hear is the, the precision, the, because that's very critical to what we do in the Navy and Marine Corps, being very precise in not only our timing, our actions, everything we do. So I, re I really like to use that. And you, you kind of mentioned some clock, how are ways, like, why does quantum, I, we have the Secretary Gertz kind of told us the official why it matters to the Navy and Marine Corps. You kind of said what are we working on, but like, how does that relate to someone on the ground, either Marine in, in the battlefield or a sailor on a ship, like day-to-day -day life, how, how can this affect us? Right. So, I mean, one classic example is uh, that, uh, you know, a submarine, it submerges, right? It doesn't have access to that wonderful GPS signal that tells you exactly where you are and exactly what time it is. And yeah. so submarines have uh, historically had the best navigation systems and best clocks that they have available. And they're, they're not perfect. And so we would like to do even better. Uh, having better position, better time aboard a submarine means you can submerge longer. Uh, you don't have to do anything you know, special to know where you are and what time it is. And then when you come up, you can execute your mission without any, uh, or, or stay below, you can execute your mission uh, without, without worry uh, for your position and time. So that's an example. Another quick one uh, that uh, the Marine Corps has a number of interesting, uh, uh, number of interesting uh, scenarios that they get themselves into in mission sets. But uh, the amphibious assault vehicles are one that uh, I think is particularly interesting. When they're dropped off miles from shore with poor visibility in one of these amphibious assault vehicles, they have to navigate their way through this, you know, potentially narrow, cleared lane uh, and get themselves to shore. That's a very challenging navigation problem. And so uh, applying better inertial sensors, uh, better clocks, and then any alternative aid you can, um, quantum or otherwise, is a, a great benefit in uh, in the challenging environments faced by some of these warfighters. Yeah, so, so Mohawk, you know we're at, we're seabed to space, right? In the Navy and the Marine Corps, you always you always want to know where you are. You always want to know what time it is, right? Uh, because as you said, it's all about precision, synchronizing, and and that's a key thing for the Joint Force. It's not just a Navy Marine Corps thing. If we're on a different time than our joint counterparts, that's not good for all of us. And so, uh, you know, knowing where you are and uh, and knowing what time it is is uh, you know is always uh, always important. And again, we want to be on the forefront of this. You know, we need to. We have the lead. We need to stay in the lead. Uh, and for all those out there who are watching this, uh, you know, it's not just discovery. You know, that's kind of a necessary step. We're trying to discover some new thing. Uh, I'm about deployment. And so your ideas of getting from discovering some of this new technology to deploying it, putting it in the hands of the sailors, Marines, or Air Force counterparts, uh, that's what's really exciting. That's why, uh, you know, I think this event so important to us uh, so we can not just discover new things, but actually uh, uh, deploy them out there in the field rapidly. And I know that's what uh, Dr. Roper, my counterpart's also interested in. We're, we're all about figuring out how to get that pipeline moving as fast as technology will allow us and not letting bureaucracy or, or uh, not working together or not bringing on a new partner or not uh, uh, encompassing a new idea get in our way. That's, uh, that is not uh, what we're interested in. 
definitely that is fantastic and what what i love about all this is there's a lot of sciencey words you you are all using that i barely understand that's really why i just have a cool haircut so they let me on these things um but what what's really critical i think you both hit on is just the value to the services the value to the people in the field doing that so, uh hondo i'm going to ask a follow-on how where how does quantum involve in the great power competition is, yeah, is so, it a so again if if you know uh, if you can act with more precision uh, and you can synchronize your force better than your counterpart, you have an in inherent competitive advantage. It's been that way since the 1600s, all right? If you yep. know when to show up, if you can, we talk about massing a force, but decentralizing how it operates, that means everybody's got to show up to the party at the same time. If you all got different clocks or, or your communication system doesn't talk to each other because it's, uh, you know, it's lost, it's, uh, it's lost its lock, uh, then, then you are not going to be effective and you've given an, an advantage away. We have that advantage right now, uh, but that advantage is fleeting. And if we're complacent and aren't bold and aren't willing to try new things, uh, take the best idea from wherever it comes from uh, around the world, uh, whatever uh, team, whatever college, whatever researcher, whatever uh, person with a bright idea, if we aren't willing to capitalize on that, we put at risk our ability to do the things we need to do around the world. And, uh, and so that's why uh, there are a few things as critical as that. That's why the Navy and the Air Force are both investing so heavily in this uh, because it's our advantage now uh, and we need, need to ensure it remains our advantage uh, as we go forward. That's excellent, that's excellent. So Dr. Willis, is there anything else that, as we're talking about quantum that you feel people in this challenge should know or be aware of or kind of from the Navy's perspective or your perspective? Well, I think one thing that strikes me from managing a number of uh, R&D programs here and S&T programs is the, the reliance that a number of these sensor systems that we're trying to build have on enabling technologies. And it's a, it's a, uh, a theme that was presented throughout the call for the the challenge here uh, in all four of the areas it was it was called out and so I, I I think it's important that we all keep our eyes on the fact that we need the lasers of the right color we need vacuum chambers you know compact vacuum systems we need uh, proper electronics and electro optic systems whatever they are we we need those things because uh, be, because a robust sensor in, of, that we put in the field is going to have to be compact and uh, stand up to environmentals, vibe, all these kinds of things. And so the, the, there's going to be significant investment in these areas, and, and the DOD knows it, um, but the, you know, the, the team should think about that, uh, I think, a little bit as they move forward. So, hey, my, uh, my closing here is just... Uh, for all the teams out there, be bold, uh, be brave, uh, think about um, not just technology for technology's sake, uh, but think about what it means to uh, those women and men that are gonna operate with it downrange and, and be creative on ways that we can take this technology uh, as quickly as we can uh, and help improve the way we're operating today and chart the path for tomorrow. Uh, you know, we, uh, these challenges are great because you get, you know, the benefit, uh, the return on collision. Uh, so uh, also be curious and listen what the other uh, competitors are thinking. It may give you a new bright idea. And if you're a govy out there, help pave the way. Uh, you know, our, our, our relevance is going to be uh, directly related to our boldness, our ability to take these great ideas and uh, help facilitate getting them downrange uh, as quickly as you can. Fantastic. Thank you both. This has been exciting, mostly because I learned that I thought I was going to go time travel today, but mostly Dr. Willis is just going to help me better my clocks at my house. So I really appreciate talking to both of you and thanks for tuning in everyone. Have a great day and have a great challenge.